understand the dire, potentially catastrophic impacts of climate change on biodiversity, let's go back in time 250 million years ago to the great dying, the third mass extinction event. Volcanoes in Siberia released carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which destabilized the climate and acidified the oceans. Warming caused the oceans to release methane, which in turn caused more warming, and over two-thirds of plants and animals went extinct. That's a scary analogy to think about, but it's the same road we've started to head down today, this time because of our own fossil fuel pollution. In the modern context, we've already seen extinction of several whole plant and animal species tied to extreme weather events. And over the next century, we know that a large fraction of species will be vulnerable to climate-mediated extinction. So what can we do to save them? That's what my research aims to address. First, we need to better understand how climate change affects different types of species differently. For high elevation species, like the pica, which I research, uh, many high elevation species, the same adaptations that allow them to survive in cold mountaintop environments make them unable to tolerate higher temperatures. So when summer temperatures are too high, species like the pica can't gather food. They have to stay underground to avoid overheating. In a recent study, I document how rising summer temperatures have caused pikas to disappear from low elevation sites across California. And I use the same data set to forecast how the species will fare as uh, temperatures continue to increase. For desert species, like the endangered lizard I study, I use the California mega drought as a window into what's likely to befall the lizards all the more frequently in the future. Desert species are vulnerable because there isn't enough food for them to survive during droughts. Second, we need to assess which species are most vulnerable. I'm working with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to assess which species are already living at the edge of their climatic tolerances, which species will be able to move on their own to track their suitable climate, and which species won't be able to keep up. But the current suite of tools commonly used for this type of assessment isn't fully up to the task. That's why I'm developing new models that incorporate species traits like their thermal physiology, diet, and dispersal ability. Finally, for those most vulnerable species, we need to find ways to save them. For some species, assisted migration, physically helping species move to track their suitable climate, may be an effective solution. For other species, like the endangered lizard I study, I'm looking into whether habitat management, like native shrub restoration, could help make the species more resilient to changing climates. But there are nine million species on Earth. A far more effective solution than trying to help each species individually is to rein in and reverse climate change. To that end, I hope that simply sharing these species' stories with public radio, with National Geographic, with newspapers, will get people talking and help contribute to the political will to tackle the climate crisis. Thank you. Thanks, Joseph. Well done. Thank you. In the assisted minute migration, is it like, take the pica, is, are you trying to uh, migrate them to higher latitudes or higher elevation or, or both, depending on the species? Yeah, well, so assisted migration is a great strategy for species like the San Bernardino golden mantle ground squirrel, which is a subspecies of golden mantle ground squirrels that's only found in San Bernardino mountains. And it looks like the habitat for that species could disappear as soon as like the next 15 years ago. So the climate envelope could close on that. But there's potential areas in the Sierra Nevada if we can find areas where it's not going to conflict with other species, where we could save the species into the future. Thanks again. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.